for toxicity. In the efficacy, um, definitely high score on the um, complexity, but also in the uh, efficiency, if something can be qualified, as I said, um, Alzheimer and MS. And in the cardiovascular, the top where the heart failure and coronary artery disease. And then I uh, mentioned to you kind of the different contents of use where we really saw um, demonstration of toxicity with our histopath in the uh, acute and then in the chronic, just uh, um, absence of toxicity were the highest contents of use. And when it comes to um, the evidentiary standard, that's definitely a conversation that needs to continue. It needs to continue among multiple stakeholders, academia and consortia and industry continue to, uh, to talk about this uh, because I think will help to uh, streamline the qualification and actually provide predictability for, for drug development. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, John Michael Sauer from the uh, Critical Path Institute, who's going to bring us uh, home, probably, hopefully, without uh, eliciting the red the red light. Oh, a challenge! I like challenges. <laughs> so, what I'd like to do within the next ten minutes is really be able to describe how the qualification process works from the submitter standpoint. I, I have to gloss over a lot of this because, as you see, qualification is pretty complex. Um, what I'd first like to do is talk about our consortium model and how many of these biomarkers are being qualified. What we try to do is create this neutral ground, this pre-competitive space, where we pull together multiple pharmaceutical companies, academics, um, FDA, EMA, to have a conversation around how qualification needs to take place and how we move forward. Now, it's a conversation. It's a partnership, right? It's not like drug development. I mean, if you think about the drug development paradigm, really what's happening there is you have pharma, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw it out there. Pharma's standing to make a lot of money around the uh, um, uh, uh, acceptance of a drug. FDA is stand, uh, standing there taking a lot of risk around the acceptance of drugs. Within qualification, it's a little bit different of a uh, proposition. In both cases, pharma as well as FDA get tools that can be used to evaluate the performance of a drug development candidate. And I think that's an important thing to, to distinguish between the two processes because when we work with health authorities during the qualification process, it really is a partnership and we work to get the best answer and try to move along as quickly as possible. So the consortia that I'd like to talk about is, is some of the work being done by the Predictive Safety Testing Consortia. It's made up of uh, 19, 18 pharma companies, um, as well as having representatives from FDA and, and EMA within the group. Our objective is to develop safety biomarkers. Here goes the members, actually, that are associated, um, the, the various consortia members as well as partners. So our, our objective here is, is to come up with biomarkers that can be used as basically surrogates of histopathology. If you think about non-clinical studies and the way that they're conducted, at the end of the study, in most cases, we go ahead and look at the tissue, and we know whether we have tissue toxicity or not, holes in the organs. In clinical studies, we don't have that ability. So what we're looking for are biomarkers that basically can go ahead and predict whether or not we have end organ toxicity. What do these biomarkers look like? Well, basically, they're like the clinical chemistry tests that you receive at the doctor's office, right, when they, when they look at your liver function, uh, enzymes, ALT, or, or bilirubin. And so that's what we're basically looking at. What I'm going to do is go through an example of, uh, of uh, nephrotoxicity biomarkers. Um, these are the various target organs that PSTC has been interested in. Of course, there's other target organs. And why are we interested in new and novel biomarkers for these organs? It's because the current biomarkers that are used are either not sensitive or not specific to the toxicity. And so in many cases, even though we have well-conducted clinical trials, sometimes we really don't know whether we have end organ toxicity occurring in those clinical trials. As I said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the kidney safety biomarkers. Right now, the gold standard for, for kidney safety is serum creatinine. But it takes approximately 50 to 60% of nephron loss in order to get serum creatinine to, to move. That's a significant amount of uh, kidney damage that needs to occur in order to get this biomarker to actually respond. So what we're looking at is the qualification 
of novel biomarkers, these eight biomarkers here that are listed. These are urinary biomarkers, they're not serum, so urine would need to be uh, collected in order to utilize these. And what we're finding is that these biomarkers are not only specific, but they're much, much more sensitive than uh, serum creatinine. And again, one thing I have to say here is we're not doing biomarker discovery, we're qualifying these biomarkers, right? These are very well-known biomarkers. So, I mean, if you're a nephrologist and I put this up, the answer is, of course, you'd use these biomarkers and go after these. What we're trying to do is build the appropriate data set so that we can receive regulatory endorsement around the biomarkers. What we have received so far is regulatory endorsement around seven of the kidney biomarkers in the rat. And this was the very first qualification that both EMA and FDA um, actually endorsed. And what we were able to demonstrate through a series of studies is that there was a correlation between the appearance of these biomarkers in urine and the histopathology in the kidney, specifically the, 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 the tubules of the kidney. We've also received uh, two letters of support, one from the FDA and one from the EMA around two, no two other novel biomarkers. And the reason here was to basically um, add additional inf non-clinical information to our clinical qualification. Um, Shashi already went through this, right, to shine light on these novel biomarkers. But what it also did was gave us the opportunity to share the data behind these biomarkers so that drug development sponsors could apply them during uh, normal INDs, right, through the I biomarker IND process. And this data can be found on our website where it goes through summaries of each of the studies. So drug development sponsors themselves can judge whether that's quality data or not and would support the use of the biomarkers. We also have some key collaborations, both with the FNIH and IMI, uh, Biomarkers Consortium, as well as IMI Safety. Um, these uh, two groups, these two uh, other consortia were founded with the same premise as PSTC. And that was around the fact that they wanted to qualify safety biomarkers. And so we came to this common ground where we could collaborate. Now, I think that's a really important thing because this is in the pre-competitive space, and it seems that the only groups that are competitive these days in the pre-competitive space are the various consortia. And so we don't need to be there, right? The objective is to get these biomarkers qualified and being utilized in the drug development space. So let me take you through what this qualification really looks like, because our end goal is to have these biomarkers qualified for use in the clinic. So we stand on basically the, the qualification for the non-clinical qualification, as well as the letter of support for the data that we generate in the rodent, demonstrating the fact that these biomarkers correlate, the, 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 the increase of these biomarkers in the urine correlates to histopathological change. What we've also done is, is we've moved towards this idea of a limited context of use. And what we've done is we've trimmed down our initial context of use, which you can see on the bottom for the confirmatory studies, to be able to get these biomarkers qualified faster. The idea is to get them out in clinical use so that we can learn more about that. These, the, this, what we call the clinical learning phase initially uh, was comprised of two studies. There was a prospective healthy volunteer study uh, where we were able to understand the baseline uh, response of these biomarkers and levels. And then we looked at the actual response of the biomarkers to a toxin, cisplatinum. We had some individuals that were, or some patients that were being treated with cisplatinum, and we could demonstrate the fact that these biomarkers were indeed responsive. The confirmatory studies are a bit more uh, robust. Uh, these are interventional studies where we have both an aminoglycoside uh, um, as well as cisplatin being used to collect uh, prospective samples, and they will then be analyzed to look at uh, whether uh, we're correct around our hypothesis and the response of these biomarkers. Here's basically the, the context of use around the claim for the limited context of use. And what you see there is it's the, this, this biomarker is proposed to be used in a cohort approach, not for individual patients, but instead groups of patients. Likewise, I think in another important issue, uh, point is to bring up, it's to be used with uh, the, the current standard of care, serum creatinine. And so that creates the safety net, right? You can't do any worse than what the current gold standard actually is. Um, again, I, I went through this already, so I'll, I'll quickly skip over this. Being a scientist, I have to show you some data. I think the most important uh, a bit of data there is in red. 
And these are the individuals, patients, who did not respond with an increase in serum creatinine, but indeed they did respond with an increase in the urinary biomarkers, showing the sensitivity of these novel biomarkers. If you look at the far right uh, column, you can see the response rate for the normal healthy volunteers, which is relatively, is, is negligible. So here goes the context of use for the prospective studies. And I think this is what we're all looking uh, forward to, where <clears throat> we can use the uh, biomarkers on an individual basis. Again, it'll be important that serum creatinine is also measured to have that safety net. Um, but uh, the, the, and, and what we found actually talking with, with several uh, industry members is that many of these biomarkers are be used, being used in a similar way that's described here but through the IND process. Here goes the actual designs of the studies. I'm not gonna belabor you with that. Um, but I think what the important part is how we actually define whether these biomarkers uh, are working or not. And that's through one, a formal adjudication process, right? Leverage the, nephro uh, the nephrologists to be able to uh, to explain whether or not these biomarkers are working, as well as a predefined statistical evaluation. So where do we need to be, right? Clearly, um, in the future, we're gonna have better definition around the qualification process. And, and Shashi gave us a taste of that, showing how the letter of support relates to limited and expanded context of uses. Um, we need to work through evidentiary standards, and there, there's a large uh, amount of work that's going into that now. Um, also, we need to figure out a way to uh, utilize retrospectively uh, um, um, obtained uh, samples with prospective analysis for qualification because, I mean, running interventional trials is extremely expensive, and we need to figure out a way to move through that quicker. And we've already dealt a little bit with this last bullet point is how to better uh, collect and uh, share uh, data in some type of data repository um, so that we could use that for qualification or other usages. Thank you.